Laboratory research has proven Topol cleans gently enough to be used every day instead of regular toothpaste. Topol uh, actually made my tobacco-stained teeth shine again. Topol Smoker's Tooth Polish. I heard these two women talking on the bus about skin that's part oily and part dry and how Cuticura soap helps, so I decided to try it. Cuticura medicated soap is designed especially for combination skin, skin that's part oily and part dry. Cuticura deep cleans oily areas to remove dirt and excess oil, and its rich, creamy emollients help condition dry patches so skin feels soft, smooth, and moisturized. Use only as directed. My skin looks and feels terrific. Cuticura medicated soap for combination skin. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Portions of this program are repeated in the Pacific Time Zone. Once again, Network Radio's number one interviewer, Larry King. Even uh, his uh, critics uh, will say that Buckminster Fuller is one of the great thinkers of our time. As he points out in the foreword to his new book, he set out 55 years ago as a penniless, unknown human with a dependent wife and a newborn child to be able to do on, effectively on behalf of all humanity, realistically develop an alternative program to what was going on then. And in Philadelphia, in his archives, there are approximately 40,000 articles published by Mr. Fuller during the last... 60 years. He has invented concepts for living. He thinks on a scale beyond today. And uh, his new book is Grunch of Giants. He'll be speaking Saturday at Hunter College all day at Integrity Day in New York, tomorrow night, Friday night here in Washington, the Shoreham Hotel. And I interrupted your little history lesson, and we were up to Darwin and Marx at living at the same time. All right. We have then the since Darwin and Marx, which is only 100 years ago, we have the catalysts who the socialists said were parasites, said we're not, we're on top of the heap, for very good reasons, survival of the fittest. They, they said the workers are very dull people. At that time, there was a misconception that two, actually two classes of human beings had gone on the planet independently, what we <laughs> call the, the, the royal blood and the, and the workers. And you really they, believe that? The, they said the workers are dull, uneducated, they have no ambition, and we are full of ambition and uh, well-informed, and we, we risk, we want to take enormous risks on behalf of humanity. So th those became the two great classes of, of our great political system, but all of them predicated on the misassumption of, of Malthus, that there's an, an inherent inadequacy of life support on our planet. So all political economics are based on and that came at the time when it was a sphere. Therefore, it was undeniable, as said. Right. So this is the law of all, all economists. And you, you say there is enough on the planet for yeah. everybody. But let, let's go back just to the word poli politics being then. Which, in view of the fact they thought there was not enough to go around, what policy do you pursue? Which are the ones that are going to starve? Can we control this? Et cetera. Th those are the things that came up. I'm, I became very excited at the time of World War I, when I was a regular United States Navy, to realize that we were, there was a new world upon us, what I call invisible world of technology. Up to the time that I was born, what we call reality was everything you could see, smell, touch, and hear. They said, let me see it, I'm a real realist. The year I was born, in came X-ray, and you couldn't see it, but it could see your bones and photographs for you. The year I was born, Marconi discovered wireless, you couldn't see him. You know, when I was three, the electrons discovered. Didn't make any newspaper, said you couldn't see no photograph of any kind. And then when I was entering Harvard in 1913, they had in the back of my physics book some yellow pages that were glued in called electricity. World War I then became this enormous war of electrons and so forth, which you couldn't see. Up to the time of, of World War I, you talked about Navy, mostly sailing ships, with how many tons of the ship, how many guns, everything at realist. Suddenly, we had in World War I new steels, and then suddenly in our ship we had, for instance, guns, the, the enemy had the same caliber guns, same, but they didn't know we had better steel, and we could fire accurately 1,000 yards further than they could. So if you fired when they came within your range, they never got a crack at you. So the 
secret weapons of World War I, this invisible new technology, which continually did more with less in very high magnitude, where up the time when I was in the Navy, we wanted to get a ship to, a message to Europe, you had to send a ship. It's going to take three weeks to even get over there, and thousands of tons of ships to get it there. Suddenly I had a little radio, 200 pounds of material, and I was talking to Europe 186,000 miles a second. So <laughs> I said there's implicit in this invisible world the capability to continually do more with less, which would get us someday to a point where we do so much with so little, we could take care of everybody. So I, my declaration 55 years ago in trying to see what a little individual could do was to get into technology and accelerate technology. And particularly, I found the most offensive weight-wise was the building world. At the time I developed the geodesic dome, and very large, large capable spheres and close the most volume with the least surface and have the greatest strength. At the time I developed geodesic domes, there were two domes in the world which were the largest domes in the world. Both were the same size, 150 feet in diameter. St. Peter's in Rome, built in 1500, and the Pantheon built in the year one, both 150 feet in diameter. The, the average of the two, their weight, they weighed 30,000 tons each. 30,000 tons is not a lot. That's the Queen Elizabeth II, for instance, of that scale. We get into oil tankers a day of 200,000 tons, so 30,000 tons is not a lot. At any rate, my first year at Dome, 150 feet in diameter, weighed 30 tons, one one-thousandth the weight of the previously largest clear span structures in history. So okay. I knew that I was really on a way to do more with less. Has uh, Bucky... Uh both systems, communism and capitalism, failed, or were they part of an evolutionary process? I think they're part of an evolutionary process, no question about it. Both of them will not be around 100 years from now? No. I, capitalism starts then with that owning of land, the claiming of land. In the game of carrying cargoes from here to there, suddenly in came ships, sailing ships, wooden ships. And up to the time of the fall of Troy, most of the cargoes were carried by camels and caravans and backs of human beings and animals. Suddenly, a ship could carry much more. So the fall of Troy was because ships were able to get there. All right, what's next? So, what is the next system? After capitalism? Yeah. It's going to be, I'd call it, the first world de democracy, first democracy in all history, actually working. We're going to have... We already have, as you know, radio-wise, and the uh, satellites and so forth. The Russian and the United States spying satellites have such sensitivity, they have equipment so sensitive, can differentiate between a goat and a, and a sheep from 100 miles out. Just think of it. We also discover that every human being has an electromagnetic field. And when the people are feeling negative, they've got a negative field. When they're feeling positive, they've got a positive field. And the people don't know that themselves. We're going to be able to have a readout of satellites all around the world, whether humanity is for this or not for it. This thing, an absolutely continuous readable democracy. We can't stop it. All these things are evolutionary on the way, yeah. Bucky Fuller, the book Grunch of Giants, published by St. Martin's Press. On February of this year, he received the Medal of Freedom. And he will speak tomorrow night in Washington, all day long uh, in New York on Saturday at Integrity Day. We'll ask about that in a while. And we'll be back after these messages. Once again, Dodge is making value news in the world of trucks. Dodge Prospector Days at your Dodge truck dealer. He's offering discounts from $75 to $1,000 on special Prospector option packages. Those discounts depend on which model and option package you choose and are based on list prices of the package items if you were to purchase them separately. You'll find special prospector packages available on most 83 Dodge Ram pickups, including the sporty Ram Page and the rugged but thrifty Ram 50, as well as most full-size pickups on both two- and four-wheel drive Ram Chargers, the ultimate towing vehicle and on Ram Tough Dodge wagons and vans. Best of all, Dodge Prospector option packages include the kind of equipment truck owners want, such as AM, FM stereo radios, air conditioning, speed control, and many more. So get the equipment you want at the price you want during Dodge Prospector days at your Dodge truck dealer. Dodge trucks are Ram Tough.
not join the people who do? Every time you get in the car, buckle up. Everyone, no matter how far you're traveling, because seatbelts save lives. So remember, get it together, buckle up, and by all means, get there safely. Why not be like people? Why not be like people? From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Once again, here's Larry. By the way, when President Reagan presented the Medal of Freedom, he said, it is given to those who have risen to pinnacles of achievement in their fields, a recognition of their accomplishment, hard work, and dedication for humanity. He called it one of the greatest privileges and distinct pleasures of the job of being president is the duty of presenting the nation's highest civilian honor, the presidential Medal of Freedom, and one of the recipients this year was our guest tonight, R. Buckminster Fuller, who says uh, we are on an inevitable course uh, in evolutionary change for the better. Before I ask you about computers, how do you know we won't kill each other off before this happens? How do I get the concept of uh, being how you, headed? How do you know we won't kill each other off? Oh, I don't know, sir. I think it's absolutely touch and go right we up to the last second now. Yeah. We could kill each other off. You bet. Uh, the, humans have been given something that no other creature has been given nor any other phenomenon we know in the universe. In addition to our brains, which many creatures have, but, uh, all the brains of all creatures are always coordinating the information, the smelling, the seeing, the touching, the hearing. Humans have been given mind, and mind has a capability from time to time to discover relationships existing in the physical universe, which you can't smell, see, touch, or hear, can't be apprehended by the brains at all. As for instance, we get where Kepler, after Copernicus discovering that the sun was not going around, uh, we were going around the sun, we have Kepler discovering all the planets had different sizes, different rates of re revolution around the sun, all very disorderly, but he's discovered Number one, they were all being held together by the sun, and you couldn't see anything. What held them together? They're millions of millions of miles apart. The Earth is 92 million miles from the sun, yet it was holding on to us. So this brought about finally the work of, of Galileo, and then came Isaac Newton. He said the interaction between two celestial bodies was varying inversely as the second power of the arithmetical distance intervening which is, say, if you double the distance between the two, reduce the interaction to one quarter what it was. And that's what Goddard saw, that we got further further out every time we double our distance out, we we less, only tendency one quarter as much tendency fall back in the earth. Now, I want to get at the point of the human mind has the capability to discover these relationships in the universe which you can't see, smell, touch, or hear, which can only be expressed mathematically. So humans have been admitted to some of the great design laws of the universe. This means we must be here for some very important reason, yet the same universe that had us born with that capability also designedly had us born naked, helpless, ignorant, having to learn by trial and error. But we've gone through at least three, three million years of development and made enough errors to finally have this radio equipment, have this capability, you and I are sitting here talking to people all over the United States, let's think of it. A fantastic capability. At any rate, we have the point now where I say, are humans wise enough to really use this capability to employ the design? I think we're, we've come to uh, very clearly to a, a new new era. I see it for the following reasons. When I was born, humanity was 95% illiterate. During that, since I've been born, we've doubled the population, but the population of the world today is 65% literate. Incredible change. When you're illiterate, you need leaders. When suddenly, if you're majority illiterate, they can do some of their own thinking. They've all been given these beautiful minds to do some really good thinking. I say that we're at a point where the universe is saying, uh, humans are good at invention. They're using these principles to develop capability to describe all humanity in a half an hour. Is that a way to use this beautiful capability to, to really employ the principles of the universe, particularly when we we, if we did use them, we could make all humanity successful. So I say that what's going on now is sort of a, a test of human beings. I said their individual integrity, do they really have the guts and courage oh. to go along with the truth as they really find it? We might fail. 
You might readily say, absolutely touch and go. Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock, was here the other evening, and he said the computer, rather than inhibiting us uh, or making us kind of numbers, will in fact free us, and that the computer will improve individuality, not decrease it. Do you share that view? I would I share that with him very much so, yes. I'd like to, I talk about the computer in a little different way. I talk about the computer, first place, capitalism has, in order to try to make money, has tried its best to get in, bring in automation, but they have labor always opposing them. They used to, as they did, move out of New England, or the cotton mills, and put the machinery in the South at low wages, and labor didn't, couldn't get down there. Those, we didn't have an automobile right then. <laughs> but today, when labor, after World War II, de deployed automated factory, labor got out of those factories with the automobile. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the computer is about to very clearly do away with all the white collar workers. It's going to be able to hold all the information, get in much more faster than the white collar workers. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon the computer is going to show that you get rid of most of the vice presidents. <laughs> and if I'm going to have just the president playing the computer, and the computer <laughs> says you can fire yourself now, <laughs> we don't need you. <laughs> so uh, what's what's it going to do to us though, or I, for I us? Can, I can see that the, already the computer has done some very extraordinary things of reversing very long-held laws of, of, of customs. For instance, when the computer came in, and it only came in because. The directors of war production of World War One and World War Two proved themselves inadequate. There are too many complexities for a human being to hold in mind. So we're going to have a World War Three, a uh, war of detente. They said we're going to have to have that computer. So the computers were developed, and while they they fi finally, after being scientifically developed, they had to get into production of them. And you, and you get into the world of production, you have extraordinary mechanics. You're building a new airplane. These mechanics make all those parts. They have right, beautiful tools to do it. But then they have to assemble the parts. And they get that airplane working on the, f on the floor of the aircraft plant. And when they finally get it all working, then they take the, the test pilot on board with them and show them how it works. Then he takes it out. But the point is the mechanics have to get the thing working. So when producing the, the computers, the mechanics had to get the computers working. And Walter Ruther said, this is a great game here. We're, we might as well use these computers while we're tuning them up to answer some very important questions. So he says, I'd like to put the problem into the computer. If I ask General Motors for enormous wage increases for everybody, life benefits of every kind, vacation and so forth, which, which way will, will General Motors make the most money, by granting or not granting? And because the numbers of General Motors employees, so many of them are their own customers, the computers keep coming back, they make more money by granting. So Walter Ruth had confronted the board of directors of General Motors in, I think it was about 1953, in the early 50s, saying, I'm, gentlemen, I'm going to uh, confront you with this, and you're going to grant. They said, Walter, how crazy can you get? Why, how do you say that? Well, because he said, I put it in the computer. <laughs> you obviously got the wrong computer. So they put it in the computer, and they came out, they were all, they were, he was right. So they made unprecedented granting back in the 50s. Within three years, General Motors is the first corporation, corporation in history to make over a billion dollars net after paying taxes. Did you see the coming of this computer age? Did you, did you forecast it? To certain, to certain mm -hmm. yeah, I think it was, to certain re re reasonable extent, you can say that I did it back in 1927. 27? Yeah. We'll be right back with Buckminster Fuller. We're going to go to your calls in about eight minutes. All our lines are going. If you get a busy signal, please hang up and call back. And his new book is Grunch of Giants. It is published by St. Martin's Press. First, this message. Quiet on the set, please. Parker. This is Hollywood. Take one. Sound. Speed. Lights. Camera. Action. Hello, everybody. This is Eric Boardman inviting you to join the fun on This is Hollywood Sunday night when my guests will be Mary Crosby talking about her father, Bing, Mr. Master of Ceremonies, Bob Eubanks, the singing sensations, the Chipmunks, and comedian Rip Taylor. That's Sunday night on This is Hollywood over many of these mutual broadcasting stations. Hello, my name is Marie Valdez, and I have a question for you. What would you say if I told you I was mentally retarded? Would you believe me? There are six million mentally retarded Americans who need help, who can be helped. 
Who's helping? The ARC, the Association for Retarded Citizens. They help me. Yes, I am mentally retarded. Build the ARC. When you give help, you give hope. From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Once again, here's Larry. Buckminster Fuller chooses to open uh, the foreword to Grunch of Giants with a, uh, a poem. It is a short poem, an essayish poem. And he writes, There exists a realizable evolutionary alternative to our being either atom-bombed into extinction or crowding ourselves off the planet. The alternative is the computer-persuadable veering of big business from its weaponry fixation to accommodation of all humanity at an aerospace level of technology with the vastly larger, far more enduringly profitable for all, entirely new world living service industry. It is statistically evident that the more advanced the living standard, the lower the birth rate. This is going to be for all our benefit if it occurs, and this book, Grunch of Giants, is Mr. Fuller's panoramic lifetime survey of all aspects of the responsibility of human beings for their own destiny. It is a manifesto, an analysis of the issues and crises that fill our daily newspapers, a humanistic plea for vision, courage, initiative, and awareness. Are you optimistic? No. I think optimists and pessimists are very far off. I'm a very hard realist. I am a, literally an engineer, mathematician, once regular United States Naval officer, had unlimited tonnage ship license. I'm an air pilot, and I have built many, many, many structures. What I'm able to tell people is that we have an option to make it on a planet, and they didn't know that, because they have been unable to see the invisible technology. And, and, and because I'm able then to tell them we have an option where they didn't know it, they say, your optimism brushed off on me. I said, that's not correct at all. To, to know we have an option is not to be optimistic. Do you ever feel uh, sad over the prospect, the likely prospect, that you won't be here to see it? Not at all, sir. I can't possibly feel badly that way. I, I, I pray it is so, and that's what I've given my life towards bringing about through technology. And I've been able to envision it, how well it could work, so I don't really have to see it any more than that. Do you think there's a possibility of life after this life? Of course there's a possibility, oh man. Nobody can talk about such things. We don't know anything about it. I'm overwhelmed with the manifest that humans did not invent the universe. They don't, would not know how to produce a human being. <laughs> they didn't invent gravity. In fact, I find they didn't invent anything. And yet our ego is very high, <laughs> and we tend to act as if we're running the universe. When I was young, we only knew about the Milky Way. When I was 28, Hubble discovered another galaxy. Between that time and a year ago, we discovered 200, 2 billion more galaxies, over 100 billion stars each. This last year, with the radio telescope, we discovered 200 billion more galaxies. I'm sure that with all the planets, of all those stars, all those galaxies, that universe is not interested whether Republicans or Democrats are elected. <laughs> <laughs> so that I'm, I'm interested in the big show. <laughs> yeah, I see. I think there's life elsewhere. Again, it's a very good possibility. What we call life, and incidentally, is our physical being. Now, physical being consists in tally of atoms, and atoms completely inanimate. So whatever life is, it is not the flesh. I, at my age of, of 88, I've consumed as food, air, and water over 300 tons of food, air, and water, which became temporarily in my hair, which I have cut off very regularly, and in my skin and so forth, and then went on, joined up something else. So I say, I am not when I ate, and I'm not my tonnage. <laughs> I am... I am Whatever I am, it is absolutely weightless, metaphysical. Whatever you and I are dealing, it can go out over the wires the way of thought. It's absolutely weightless. So whatever human beings are is, is not physical. So uh, that being so, I can understand how the non-physical 
principles which the universe is governed to be operating of gravity and so forth will be operating all through the universe, and that there could be other minds elsewhere with a facility such as our body. Our, our bodies are so we can get information locally to touching things, smelling them, hearing them, as local information gatherers and local problem solvers. But I, I can see how we have life elsewhere very, very definitely. The, uh, are you first and foremost a mathematician? I, I never classified myself. That, that game of specialization was you know, imposed by the power structures. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> classify ourselves. Right? The, uh, the structure classifies us. But I, I certainly, I think every human being is a born mathematician. How would you classify yourself? What I call a generalist. You're a generalist. I'm a comprehensivist. Every child is born interested in everything. Our Buckminster Fuller, we are going to pause for uh, news on the hour and then your opportunity to talk to a uh, giant among us in the highest sense of that word. The book Grunch of Giants deals with Mr. Fuller's new word for giants. He coined the phrase Spaceship Earth. And this book is the uh, logical follow-up to Critical Path. Buckminster Fuller will speak at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington Friday night at 7.30. If you want information, area code 202-628-1577. He will speak uh, all day as part of Integrity Day starting at 10 a.m. at Hunter College in New York City all day Saturday. His book, Grunch of Giants, is published by St. Martin's Press. We will pause for news and then your questions. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System, your network for news and sports. How would you like an important job right here in town? What if I told you right now you're qualified? No, you're not too old, not for us. And you won't be turned away because you're young and inexperienced. We need all the help we can get. We're the American Red Cross. We depend on volunteers like you to help us help. We'll let you do the work you've always wanted to do but never had a chance to try. We'll help you learn new skills. We'll help you learn to be a leader. Red Cross volunteers help out in health clinics, nursing homes, and hospitals. Red Cross needs your help in disaster situations to collect and distribute blood, drive Red Cross vehicles, assist the elderly, teach community service courses in health and safety. And remember, you may be able to translate your Red Cross skills into employment credentials. Become a valuable asset to your community. Become a Red Cross volunteer. Call Red Cross. We'll help. Will you? Mutual News, Mike McCluskey reporting via satellite. Air Canada Flight 797 caught fire at 31,000 feet Thursday night. The pilot landed the burning DC-9 at the Greater Cincinnati Airport about 20 minutes after the fire started. 23 people died in the blaze, which continued with the plane on the ground. Rita Wetterstrom, the spokeswoman at the airport, told Mutual News the incident is being investigated. The National Transportation and Safety Board has arrived. They are doing their, their preliminary investigation. At this time, there are approximately 23 fatalities. We have, do not have the cause of death. They have been removed from the plane and have been taken over to our temporary morgue. Airport spokeswoman Rita Wetterstrom in Cincinnati. The plane carried 41 passengers and a crew of five. In addition to the 23 fatalities, 18 people aboard were hospitalized. A fireman at the scene was also injured. Heavy smoke from the fire caused the airport to be closed for two hours Thursday evening. This is Mutual News. I don't understand this. Hollywood Information Marketing advertises like crazy on the radio. People call that free 800 number for the catalogs all the time. But me, the special California operator, I just sit here waiting. What's wrong? The commercial says in California, call 213-856-0280. It's a great...